it's in the new year, so we shall see here. Silence is golden. Um, okay. Important um, acknowledgement of country. Um, so David, who's sitting in the United States, um, in Australia, we have a tradition um, in gatherings and events of acknowledging the traditional owners. I don't know if that's a thing that happens in the States, um, but uh, we wish to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many and diverse lands on which we meet here today. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and we give thanks for their enduring stewardship of the environments in which we live and work. This is the first of our webinars, Our Ut. We will have a presentation by Peter Fagan, um, who was a participant in the Australian Survivor. Uh, we will also have Rayleigh Lancaster and Karen Tyser from Griffith University, as well as Kaylee Schultz from the Ipswich Libraries. I hope I have this names if I have to Okay, after that there will be a question time session where we'll have more active kind of to and fro around that. So um, if you have questions as people are presenting, please put them into the chat um, and those will be kind of collated. So if we get five people asking the, first question, the same question, that will definitely be one that we make sure we make it for in our question time. Okay. Peter Fagan, um, an Australian uh, survivor participant um, and a man of many, many talents and a strong background, interestingly enough, in relation to aviation. Um, so, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you at this point and uh, I shall stop presenting and allow you to take the stage. Fantastic. Thanks, <clears throat> Tony. And um, g'day, everybody. Peter Fagan. Uh, so you're recording this, uh, so there's no plausible or implausible deniability, I guess. I have to watch, watch what I say. Um, I've got 15 minutes of fame, so I'll, um, I'll, uh, I promise to stay the distance. So if there's any Australian Survivor super fans out there, you'll um, understand the, um, uh, that, how that may be amusing. Um, so I'm, I'm about half a kilometre from Parliament House, Canberra, so I hope the bandwidth holds up. Um, we've got the worst bandwidth in Australia, I think. Uh, probably for good reason. It's being used for uh, other purposes. Um, so the first of these, I, I, I should have known that and I didn't, so I apologise. So I guess I'm blessed to be here. I'll, uh, I'll talk for about five minutes on Survivor and then I'll clumsily segue into uh, COVID-19 and how that's affected me and uh, the people around me. Um, starting with Survivor. So why Survivor? About 15 years ago, I was interested in Survivor, um, but Australians couldn't participate. There was only the uh, American show. So uh, I waited a long time and then uh, oh, 20, 2015, my wife, I'll blame her for this, she suggested I, uh, I apply. And um, there, there's, for those who know, there's three parts of Survivor. There's a social game, there's a strategic game, and then there's, um, there's the challenges. So it's, definitely the challenges that interested me. Um, if there are super fans, uh, and I, I didn't even know these existed before I participated in the game, which uh, I'm a little bit ashamed of, uh, but um, to the super fans, um, all survivors are meant to be interested in winning the game. I, I, I actually wasn't. I just wanted to participate in the challenges. But there were other things that happened as the game rolled out, if, if you have watched it, that, um, that were were not intentional. Um, so the, the way Survivor works is you, 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 you fill out a, a form to apply and that may take two or three days. It's a really, really uh, um, intrusive and deep and quite broad application process uh, in terms of filling, just filling out the form. Um, you, then, you then go through uh, a number of stages. Um, but your application and then a, a three minute video is attached to your application. So uh, 15,000 people in Australia sat around waiting for a call from, um, from the uh, Endemol Shine, the, um, the company who was, who was running this for um, Channel 10. A lot of people received Skype calls first. Uh, many of the 15,000 didn't get any call at all. Um, I got a call straight away saying, you're going to be uh, taken to auditions. 
straight away. So I didn't even get a Skype call, which is remarkable. I think that might have been age. They probably wanted, um, you know, a broad spread of different types of people. You've probably seen there's some very good looking uh, men and women um, who are, you know, mid twenties, and then they have a range of other people above that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, so the next part of the process is um, a, a medical a psychological review. Uh, in fact, several psychological interviews, uh, a fitness test involving swimming and jumping and strength and things like that, uh, police check, and then the audition. Now, I, I've always thought that I, I was in the military and, you know, I held different uh, security classifications and, um, and I always thought that the Australian survivor process uh, was far more deep and intrusive and broad compared to uh, even joining the military. So that was remarkable. Uh, so then we moved to the auditions. Now, just prior to this, I had uh, I had walked past a store in Sydney, the Hugo Boss store, and there was a bright red suit in there. And this was before I'd even considered Survivor. So uh, we I walked in with my wife and we bought the red suit. Um, and the red suit became quite... Um, quite a novelty. Just a moment, I'll see if I can bring that up. Basic. I've got some... Uh... No, I can't see it. I'll try again in a moment. So, um, so I wore a bright red suit to the, um, uh, into the audition. Uh, and the point about auditions with these sort of shows is that you, you have to have a point of difference. So you have to strike straight away. So all of you, how many have we got? We've got 40 participants now within the first three seconds would have made an assessment of me and decided what you thought of me, decided who I was and what I was and uh, whether you liked me or not. That's, that went from probably 20 years ago, seven minutes, then down to about 20 seconds. And it, it's, it's finally, as you would, I'm sure you, some of you or all of you would know, you make an assessment on people in three seconds. So you don't do it physically, all of your senses do that for you. So, um, so that was my, my, uh, my strategy for the, um, uh, for the auditions. Now the auditions were, were groups of uh, 10 or 15 people and we were asked questions, we were asked to do things and it was, it was really a behavioral interview in how we, how we manage that now at the end of, the, um, at the end of this you when the audition finished you're either given a walked out everybody walked out of the room you're either given a piece of paper or um or nothing so they'd catch you as you walked out of the room if you received a piece of paper you were selected so i walked out of the room and didn't receive a piece of paper and um it, it was quite an interesting audition because there were some moments during that which again were quite humorous and um, uh, I, was, um, I was being quite cheeky to a couple of the people. I found out one was the general manager, unscripted content. Another one was an executive producer. And the, uh, the panelists thought it was hilarious how we were interacting. And they, they, were, they were interacting just the same. So out we walked and we were staying at the same hotel that the audition was held at in Sydney at, uh, at the Rock, uh, Darling Harbour rather. And uh, we walked out, we went for dinner that night and I got a call. Uh, a few hours later, and it was from the uh, general manager, unscripted content, lovely guy. And he said, Peter, we, we were, it was the end of the day and we didn't have a lot of time. We wondered if you'd have time to come back tomorrow. So long story short, I'm in the game and that's it. Um, so you, you, you might have seen that I was uh, in Australian Survivor for 17 days. Now, what happens after you're selected is you get a date and you catch an aircraft to Sydney, you overnight in Sydney, you're not allowed to talk to anybody, you're under uh, a nom de plume when you arrive at the Sydney hotel, so they meet you there, uh, the, the uh, production crew walk you through, uh, you're not allowed to talk to any member of the public, you're, you're taken to your hotel room and your um, baggage is inspected, you know all this is going to happen, so that you, they can be assured that you're not taking any prohibited items with you, prohibited items meaning anything, apart from uh, the clothes that you've been approved to take. Um, so the next morning, um, we're, again, we're not allowed to look at anybody we believe may be a contestant. We're certainly not allowed to talk to anyone who may be a contestant, but you can work out because you can see production crew 
are walking small groups of people into the uh, into the um, into the uh, airport. Uh, we caught an aircraft, uh, and again, you could see people on the aircraft who were possibly uh, contestants. Uh, we landed at um, New Zealand and then flew on to Samoa, arriving late at night. Um, again. We were, we were told strictly that we could not say anything or look at anybody from the time we left the aircraft. Uh, we were herded in groups of eight into uh, little white vans. All of the windows were blacked out and we were told to put on a, uh, an eye mask. So that again, so that not only couldn't we see outside, we couldn't see anyone else in the van. And again, so this was the process all the way through for the next week that we were then dispersed around Samoa in hotels. Uh, we had to stay in the room. We had no TVs. We had no clocks. We had no sensory inputs whatsoever. So for seven days, we were in hotels and they would, um, they would uh, leave a food tray outside for different meal times. And then uh, after about three or four days, we then went, uh, we were then picked up and, and taken to uh, the Sheraton at Appia. And uh, we had photo shoots. Uh, we had uh, interviews with uh, magazines and newspapers. Uh, we had some promotional videos taken. And, um, and then uh, we'd go back to the room. And, uh, and again, it was, it was what I imagined being in jail was like. Now the interesting part is it was lockdown for us. So that was, that was pure lockdown, but we were on our own with no inputs, no one to talk to. And a production crew would take us for a, a 30 minute walk once a day. And that was it. And we'd have a sneaky chat then with those people. So we were not told about uh, what would happen the next day, when we would start filming, but you know, when production would start, nothing. So people were starting to get cranky, but uh, we, we talked afterwards, obviously, by about day five, a lot of people were getting cranky uh, that uh, nothing was happening. And we were just sitting around waiting for Godot. Um, then the Sunday, that's the day before the shoot, the, the product, start of production, we were loaded onto small trucks. So if you've watched season, what is actually season three of Survivor, uh, you can see the start of the show, the very first episode has uh, three trucks with eight people in, all moving off um, uh, down some dirt roads, driving, driving, and they had uh, drone video and they had videos on the truck and uh, that's where all that came from. That was pre-recorded for the show. Um, again, we were sitting for either side of the back of the truck, looking at what would be our colleagues um, for the next up to 55 days. Um, and again, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. Now I've got my red suit on and this was a humorous moment right at the start. So if you can, if you can visualize this, we're sitting, um, four aside on each side, left and right of the truck, looking at each other, production, uh, yelling and shouting at us not to look at each other, not to talk, but just about when we're ready to drive off, uh, the crew jump in the front of the truck and we were the last truck in line. And I had snuck two black sports socks into my suit pockets that they hadn't detected. And I looked at everybody and I thought, I've got to break the ice here. So I took the two, two black socks out of my inner pockets and I put one on each ear. So you've got this old gray haired guy in a red suit uh, with, a, uh, with a camel t-shirt on in, in multicolored camel with two black socks hanging like dog's ears from his ears. The whole truck just burst out laughing and um, production didn't know what was happening. By the time they jumped out, I'd take them off and we all sat there. So that was a, a, a funny moment that was repeated on my last day. So uh, I, I, I better move through quickly because we're spending a lot of time on Survivor. So what happened was whilst we were in uh, the hotel, I, I, I uh, contracted a stomach bug. Two of us did actually. Um, Bianca did as well, and she she um, she recovered quite well. I never recovered and didn't eat for the next uh, what are we talking the next ten days. So I lost about twelve kilos in in ten days because it's it's there's high activity obviously with all the challenges, um, and I was getting delirious. And um, medical and psychology were telling production to um, to take me out of the game, but they wanted me to stay in, 
um, because um, you know it, it, it was it was good fun having me in there. I think, and we were there was two of us in in that particular tribe that were were winning a lot of the challenges for the tribe. So they didn't want me out, but uh, and and they have uh, precedence over the medical team. So we got to the to uh, three days before, and I said to the the again this this same guy, general manager, unscripted content. I said I've got to leave, mate, because um, I, you know I'm really concerned about um, my health. And he said, can you stay in for another three days? So we agreed on that. The last day, Jonathan Lapalli is there. They drove up in a speedboat, and all of the cameras are on me leaving. And um, somebody said, tell the story about the black dog ears. So I told the story about the black dog ears, and I, I, I won't say what the executive producer, because he was, uh, he was a crazy man. And everybody is bursting out laughing. The executive producer blew up, expletives everywhere. This is not meant to be funny. This is meant to be sad. <laughs> you know, so I jumped on the, on the um, speedboat with Jonathan LaPaglia and we came home. So there's a lot more stories. We could spend two hours on this, but I won't. Um, so, um, Tony, you'll tell me when to stop, won't you? Keep going, Peter. You've got a few minutes. Okay, okay, thanks, mate. So, COVID. I'll show you something. So, I'm sure a lot of you, during COVID, you saw, there was a guy in Madrid, and, uh, and he was arrested while he was walking down the street. And uh, just a second. Would you believe that video disappeared, Tony? I'll find it. So um, yeah, this guy was arrested in, in Madrid and he had dressed up in a dinosaur suit. Um, you probably remember that. So on March the 12th, I was driving back to Canberra and, uh, and that was the last day that I was, I guess, that was the last day pre-COVID for me. And I was running a very big, um, uh, uh, tender response, a four billion dollar tender response for uh, the company I work for, because um, the guy who worked for me, who was running it, got actually frightened of running it and said, "I can't do this, Peter. You're going to have to do it." So he actually resigned just before COVID. COVID. I think he's regretting that now. And uh, so I took this over, and I'm driving back, and I saw this guy in Madrid with his dinosaur suit. Uh, walking around Madrid, looking really sad, and he got arrested by uh, the police, but he wasn't charged, he was taken home. So, it was something like that, you might remember. What did I do? Got online, ordered one of those, went to Parliament House one morning, and decided to be a dinosaur. So that was the start of my COVID. Everyone's different. With COVID, I think, it, you know, it's behavioural, it's personalities, it's DNA. I get stir crazy. So I'm locked in doing this tender. And some days it was uh, 3 a.m. in the morning till 10 p.m. at night. I had a 70 person team, 12 subcontractors. Um, I had um, uh, one of the subcontractors was Bell Textron in Texas, Texas, another, another company in Canada. And uh, we're putting together this bid over five months. It just finished on the 10th of July. So it, it's, it's a really important bid. I think we'll probably win it for, for, for uh, the company I work for and Bell. Um, but I'm managing, suddenly managing 70 people as the bid manager. And I'm, I've, I moved from uh, a bid process where everybody's face to face and occasionally we have some call-ins to everything on Teams. We, we use Teams rather than Zoom. Sometimes we use uh, Zoom. But, and I've moved into a, a, a mode where I would be on Teams meeting, sometimes there'd be eight or 10 Teams meetings, each with PowerPoint presentations, um, really, really busy. And um, so that was all consuming. And th the fortunate thing was that I, I, I could have had no work, but um, government business, defense business has been really, really busy all through COVID. So I've, I've, in that regard, I've been very fortunate. And you have to think of the good and the bad through COVID, I think. But stir crazy. Uh, what I would make sure I did for mental health, because right at the start, I thought um, there's going to be a big impact on mental health through, through this. Uh, and there is, and there will, it will be worse. Um, and I thought I've got to get out once a day. So um, what I do for COVID is um, I put on five kilos which is appalling because um, five kilo just doesn't work for me because 
I, I, I love Tough Mudder, if you know these things. I love Spartan. I love Australian Ninja. I was shortlisted for Australian Ninja. And um, no one, I think, has done it at my age. I'm 66. So, um, so here at home, I've got a, a, a really busy um, a training routine that I do throughout the day. So, so I'll, I'll just run through the list so you have an idea. Uh, Push-ups, pull-up bar, balance board. That's the one you stand on for five minutes. Triceps, dips, hangs, free weights, skipping, burpees, sit-ups, stretches, and planking. So planking is really hard for me. And uh, the requirement for um, Australian Ninja is five-minute planking, uh, five-minute um, hangs, five-minute uh, pull-ups and push-ups, and five-minute skipping. So if anyone's done planking, it, they know how tough it is. I started one minute and I added 10 seconds. And then I got sick of adding 10 seconds and I had half a minute and I got to eight minutes in about uh, uh, four weeks. So, um, so that's, that's my experience in COVID. Um, just before we go, I'll try one more time to bring uh, my screen share up. And if I can find, now for some reason I can't find, yeah, I'm sorry, Tony, I can't find those, um, uh, those photographs. I'll, I'll try while someone else is talking and maybe we can do it at the end. No problem, Peter. Thank you very much for sharing. It, it's been delightful. Um, I'm going to move on um, to our presentation here. Uh, screen. And um, I'd be pleased to announce um, to everyone present that uh, Peter is going to be gifted with a, uh, a gift voucher. Um, which has been brought to us by IOP Publishing. Um, this is a gift voucher that was, um, was given to the LA Friends Bank Group um, in support of another event that hasn't actually happened, but they've kindly consented to that being um, used in this event. Um, so thank you, Peter, very much for your participation. Um, and IOP Publishing, everybody, um, they are well and truly worth taking a look at, and we do thank them for their support of events like this in our Okay, our next presentation comes from uh, Rayleigh Lancaster um, and Karen Tyso from Griffith University. Um, and this is the Griffith Library about knitting isolation. Um, so I will hand over now to Rayleigh. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, um, so <laughs> um, I'm. Um, um, I am Rayleigh. Um. And I'm Karen from Griffith <laughs> Uni. Hi. Um, so yeah, um, um, so oh, we just wanted to sort of like have a chat um, about like, about how working from home was um for us um and that like experience coming from uh, uh, um from uh, uh, um from front line services um staff um here at griffith um and so um yeah i guess like for me the beginning was definitely really difficult um um mainly because I li like lived, lived uh, um, by myself. Um, so I was com like completely um, isolated during that time. Um, and, uh, and, uh, um, and I really um, appreciated um, Peter raising the point about uh, old mental health um, because that was definitely impacted um, during COVID. Um, absolutely. Um, Karen, um, how did you find it? Like, did you have uh, 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 um, in, 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 um, struggles um, in the beginning? Thanks, Rayleigh. I did. I, I, I love people and I love, I, I'm bad at being still too. I, I need to move and keep wandering around. So I found it very disorientating. I mean, yes, I'm at home. It's my home. And yes, I had my animals. But um, 
it, it was really hard to settle and to pay attention. And, and we've sort of gone from a lot of physical work suddenly to eight hours on the computer. And I, yeah, I can see why my kids couldn't sit still because I can't either. Um, so I, I sort of went from overdoing things to like too much screen time, sore eyes, headache, you know, then sort of feeling vague and wishy-washy and not sure where I was at. Uh, and, and for me, I actually then had a real medical emergency. Well, I didn't, my daughter did. And she ended up, she picked a pandemic to have a respiratory disaster and had her first ever asthma attack and actually ended up in Gold Coast Hospital, which is one of the main COVID hospitals. Um, she almost died twice and we weren't even allowed to be there because she was in the COVID ward. So all these things suddenly became really real. And, um, and what it did do, that was give me a good kick in the butt and teach me that, hey, things can be worse. Um, and, and after that, um, training, at least we had training and then we had project work. Um, and one of the things was we had free access to LinkedIn. And one of those training videos, David Crenshaw has a training video about time management and working from home. And that, after a real emergency, I know that suddenly clicked and I really liked that video and it talked about being meaningful and, and setting a routine and getting there. And so yeah, it got better to that. How about you? What made things better for you? Um, definitely the projects work um especially because during the working from home period um um like i wa uh, was studying in my library um degree and in those classes we were talking um about uh, uh alter meta data and like library services and how 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 uh, our um there's a big push now for library services to be a to be a, a, a um offered um digitally um as well um and so it was great doing that like 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 uh, like like meta data um project work and just actually offering services online and that really synced well with my classes and so that really helped me sort of move along um and i think that was the biggest um the biggest thing for me was just finding things each day that just kept me trucking. Um, and so I bought a, a visual art uh, um, diary um, um, and I kept, um, kept uh, um, sketches and like collages and, and just, just like um, leaves from the park. <laughs> and so, yeah, so um, that, was, that was really, really enjoyable. Um, yeah, um, and also it was like quite good to get to know my colleagues um a bit better because uh as we also used um teams and um and we like uh, we had uh, we had we had a, a, a dumb buddy um uh, um like um like 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 um pairings um so that uh, we had uh, uh, some um some some body to check uh, uh, um, in with um each day um and and so uh, uh, just just like sharing memes or gifs or jokes um with my uh, I, my colleagues um was a lot of fun and yeah that was yeah really enjoyable we did, we, there were some funny moments. Um, yes, there were a lot of amazing gifts and memes and, and Donald's weekly funnies here at Griffith became daily and sometimes morning and afternoon ones to keep everyone ticking over. Uh, yeah, we went from Teams was fairly new and we weren't using it a heck of a lot. We hadn't to, to having to embrace it. And, and I think, you know, 
yeah, that sort of became a bit of a lifeline because on a bad day, you could video call each other and at least see each other's faces. And, and just seeing everyone's names pop up every morning and saying hi. Yeah, it was, it was nice. That became, it was like, oh, it was a big thing. It's like, oh, look, and here's another one and say hello to this one. And yeah, so it, it, even though we weren't face to face, we were still seeing each other in a way and, and that became really more meaningful too. Um, one funny thing was um, chat. We were doing chat from home, whereas we couldn't really do phones. And there was a section, you, you know, it's been a really slow week when there's been nuisance chats that would pop up, say something silly and disappear. And, and it's really bad when you're sort of like trying to chat back to them going, no, no, stay, just talk to me. Talk to me for another minute. <laughs> so you, you know, that's a good week. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so so we ha it has had its, its funny moments, uh, and we have certainly all got a lot better at using it. Sort of technology still bites occasionally, but but we're getting there. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. It, 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 and like uh, uh, I could, um, currently, it, it, um, some stuff have come um, back to to the. It, the libraries um but there are still people at home um and so trying to keep that like that that like that online uh, uh i'm relationship if i'm going um that i think has been also really um yeah like really important um for our teams as well so yeah um so um i guess like um Cara and and i um just uh, i want to uh, to chat at, at um together the, uh, uh, but we we also developed a a, a, a um a, a um, a, a, a um, video uh, oh, from our from our or, 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 um, colleagues um, just giving their perspectives um, um, as well um, and so I will play the video for you just one moment while we get all the technical things going <laughs> we, we did advertise that we had it in the fancy stadium uh, on teams, which is really lovely because it does look like you're all in a lecture theatre together. Um, but this is where technology may have bitten us a little bit. Um, so there is a lovely shot of what it did look like. Um, it didn't record that way. So we're learning. Um, that's, there's always something new and, and we're still learning. But yeah, yeah. I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Gonna run around everyone, and we were just hoping for a little snippet of what you found hard about working from home, and what was good, and how did we all stay connected, and if there was anything funny. Hey, yes, um, I found it quite hard at first working from home. It was for me, it was almost like starting a new job. Mm -hmm. Um, after a while, I got used to it, and um, I, towards the end, I actually enjoyed working from home. But at first, it was quite difficult for me, especially because I felt like I had to sit at my desk for like five hours straight without getting up. So I, <laughs> I had quite a sore back after a while, and I had to make myself get up and grab a cup of coffee or, or grab a cup of tea and um, come back to. Just, I found that I was a lot more productive. I think I got a lot more done because there was not the um, interaction with your colleagues. You sort of didn't get to chat as much, I guess. You only sort of, you know, try to keep, keep up and um, communicate on teams with them, but it's not really the same. Um, I loved working from home. <laughs> And even my grumpy cat eventually forgave me for hanging around her house every day for too long. Um, I worked out on my deck, so it was lovely outside looking at the trees and the cat sat next to me. Um, I, I did miss chatting in, into office. 
Um, but I found myself using the chat function to contact people to see how they were going and have a bit of a online chat. Um, I don't think there was anything negative about it for me. I loved it. Okay. Unlike Joe, well, I hated working from home at the beginning. Absolutely hated it until like I, I missed the division between home and work, like getting up, having a routine and coming into work and talking to people. But once I got into a routine and started walking every morning with a friend and I, I kind of created a bit of division that way, then once I settled into my groove, I, I really loved it. But again, I'm still happy to be back on campus now. Uh, one of the good points about working at home was that I was able to connect and contact lots of staff that I don't normally contact so we would log on in the morning and say hi and that was really that was good one of the funny things was that I turned into a green thumb I've always been really good at killing plants but, and I guess that the face-to-face -face, even though we would um, talk to people on the phone and have video still the in person face to face is what I miss. So uh, I didn't, working from home, I didn't like it at first, but I eventually got used to it and it was sort of hard to come back to campus um, after getting used to it, but now I'm used to being back on campus now. But the difficulties I had um, working from home was probably the technology was the hardest because I had, my computer was quite slow and I was working from a Quite a small screen on my laptop. Good things were not having to do the commute, it was very good, um, and having my two puppy dogs um, close by. Um, yeah, so I found working from home was going to be the ultimate fantasy, but then I didn't like it at all, and even I didn't even get to really like it by the end either. So. Um, I found it hard to take lunch breaks. Uh, I found homeschooling basically the biggest nightmare ever. I actually had to take leave to, you know, do homeschooling properly for a while. But the only benefit was that I loved getting to know people when they had enough time to communicate on Teams in chat and getting to know people from other areas as well. So I found that different people were interacting on Teams than probably would in the office, which I just thought was quite beautiful and the only thing that was good is that I did perfect my homemade baked bean recipe because <laughs> I'd get up in the morning and I had soaked my beans overnight and the only benefit of being at home is that at 10 o'clock I could finish them off. Yeah. Um, well um, with working from home as we were leading up to it I was imagining a nice relaxing peaceful time with my desk set up next to my two children doing their study at school at home. It was quite stressful at first and um, but as the time went on the children kind of really lost interest in school at home and they'd log on for five minutes to say they were going on a break and then they wouldn't come back and I kind of welcomed that because it meant I had a bit of peace to do work. So the student outreach program meant that I got to make phone calls to as many students who would answer the phone when I called them and it was really nice to hear students' perspectives and the ones who did answer the phone, the majority of them had adapted very well to online study, even though they were first years straight out of school. So that was an enjoyable part of the experience. Um, I found working from home challenging in the beginning. Um, my whole family starts work very, very early, so I'd get up and the house would be empty. So then I'd go down to the study downstairs and I'd be by myself in a room for the seven hours, 15 per day staring at the wall so I found it a little bit hard the other thing is my husband would come home at about three o'clock he'd either whip a snip outside my window where I was trying to work or he would play Elvis quite loudly upstairs so I'd have to say turn it off turn it down so they were the sort of they were the main things I had to contend, contend with but as as it progressed I got used to working from home and it became easier cool. just a bit daunting in the beginning um now Miss Jessie you're still at home. How's your journey been? Because you've done it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have been working from home for about five months. Yeah, then something good like 
I feel more relaxing. And also I can sign my parcel delivery. I don't need to go to post office or parcel <laughs> locker. There also something I find like I miss everyone, miss my colleague. Then also I can't get the immediate assistance from colleague when working from home. Then yeah. Regan, are you still at home or are you back on campus now too? Yeah, no, I'm still at home as well and I will be um, for the foreseeable future. Um, came from home actually kind of worked out well for me because... I was going to um, say only... congratulations, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Because <laughs> I'd only just recently um, found out I was pregnant and so <laughs> um, working from home... I have a snack whenever I want if I needed to lie down for a few. But yeah, I did find the downsides and I I guess sometimes a little bit with motivation it was hard hard to want to do stuff, but I think that was also due to being very tired and not <laughs> just being to sleep all the time. Yeah, we had um sort of frosted buddy groups at the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um and you just sort of have a um, like a teams meeting catch up once a week and just yeah. chat about how things were going and like it didn't have to be work related or anything just to make sure everyone was going okay and uh, the funniest thing is my dog he will get up with me he said okay mom is going to do this now <laughs> I'll go to the room he knows okay there's a bean bag he will sit with me until I log off until five o'clock then he said, it's time to get off work now, you know. I'm just, and I've gone into a bit of green thumb like Indiana, just watering my plants and you know, that sort of thing. You know, the only thing that I miss is the physical part of yeah. with my colleagues. Thank you so much for sharing that montage with us, guys. That was, um, that was really interesting to see just so many different people's experiences. Um, and I'm going to move right along to our next stage of the show. So um, that was Rayleigh and uh, Karen. Thank you very, very much. And our next presenters are Kaylee um, from Ipswich Libraries, and she is also sharing that experience with. Um, her Office of Number in the United States, um, who has actually joined us from there in real time, so it must be about sort of 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning there by now. Um, so, from Brisbane to Brooklyn, via Wuthering Heights. Hi, uh, David, would you like to turn your camera on as well, um, so everyone can see you? There you are. Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, but um I'm having I'm having a lot of fun and um the uh, the, the testimonies were really compelling. Um and I identified great. everyone. Excellent. Well I hope the coffee's still, you know, coursing through your veins. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, I'm Kaylee and I'm a public programmer from Ipswich Libraries. I'm really happy to present here tonight. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to the previous speakers and I've found to have very similar experiences, uh, especially with the last team that were talking. I'm still working from home for the record, on the record. <laughs> okay, as the title suggests, this adventure is about a connection that developed between myself and a group of people halfway around the world through a piece of literature. It only came about due to the COVID crisis and I feel that like these types of connections and adjustments of processes and values similar to what the last team were talking about are a real silver lining to come out of what has truly been a devastating situation. Okay, this story, it needs to be shared here at the Alia Queensland Tribal Council. It demonstrates the important role public programming, library public programming plays within its communities. I had accepted the challenge to outwit the COVID crisis 
Okay, my tribe, Ipswich Libraries, needed to explore the unfamiliar terrain of online programming, including book clubs. So began my virtual trek of public libraries around the globe. I had been, uh, had been tasked to find out what was being offered in the virtual library world. Now this was early April and Queensland was only a week or two into lockdown. Not too many Australian libraries were offering online programming yet, so I cast my net wider and I started looking at what international public libraries were doing. After searching far and wide, I discovered the Brooklyn Public Library, also termed BPL, that's what the, the locals call it. Right, David? <laughs> and their incredibly diverse online programming, but we'll touch on that a bit later. At the time, I was focusing on virtual book clubs and one offering in particular jumped out at me. It was the Leonard Library Classics Book Club and they were doing, you guessed it, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Now, as a librarian, this was one physical challenge that I was ready for. I had never read Wuthering Heights, and this is much to my shame as a recently graduated librarian. So this program ticked multiple boxes. I registered to attend and then hastily did a call out to my tribe members to borrow a copy of this classic story. <sighs> now to set the scene, at this time in early April, New York was being ravaged by the virus with around 800 deaths per day, and it peaked with a day of over 3,000 deaths. It's, it's so unimagin unimaginable, I couldn't believe it. Everyone was in lockdown. It was like a battle zone. I had been following the news, and I was shocked by what I was seeing in New York. I was really a bit worried about how I would be re received and what the Brooklyn tribe would think of an Aussie interloper. Of course, I didn't need to be worried. They welcomed me warmly. And I believe David, <laughs> the Brooklyn librarian, was quite surprised to have an attendee from down under. I was really lucky that the time difference between Brisbane and Brooklyn worked out to be doable. The book club was on at 7.30 p.m., which is 9.30 a.m. in Brisbane. Much more doable than poor David right now. There was a handful of regular attendees and others would join the weekly meeting when they could. Over the next few months, a camaraderie grew between myself and the Brooklynites. We shared experiences, both joyful and sad, and got to know each other on a personal level. They got to see me trying to teach my son during the remote learning period, not good, and also met my noisy toddler. I felt a real link to New York and Brooklyn in particular. During the months of the book club, I was really invested in how things were going over there. I watched the news reports and I was often in tears with the devastation. By this stage, they were nearing 20,000 deaths. Even though we were also in lockdown here in Brisbane, I really felt a bit like a fraud. Each week I'd zoom over to Brooklyn to join these people who were truly going through the worst imaginable. I was sitting here in Queensland where to date, like now, we've only had just over 1,100 confirmed cases and six deaths. I felt some guilt that I was witnessing the real pandemic horror through these people. And also during this time, the historic Black Lives Matter protests were taking place. In fact, during one online meeting, I could hear people shouting and a helicopter overhead and I asked what the noise was and David and his partner Susanna said that a protest was currently happening outside on the street. This really affected me. It was weird. I felt both connected and disconnected. I was experiencing history being made, but I was not directly part of it. It was a really strange place to be. Over time, an unexpected alliance has developed between David and myself. We have had discussions and meetings outside the book club about our work as librarians and have shared ideas about programs and events. What I was really curious about was how the BPL was, so, was able to be so flexible and so responsive in its programming. They have the most innovative online programs that you can imagine. I 
I recommend everyone get online and have a look at them. Um, everything from bilingual story times or even, you know, first language story times, um, philosophy discussion groups. They've got an erotica book club for adults. I might have to join that one, David, sorry. No. <laughs> They've got uh, support programs for people such as new parents, small business owners, those helping, uh, those needing help with literacy. They also have an amazing array of teen and young adult program offerings such as do-it-yourself beauty, skincare, virtual open mic sessions, social games and gaming. And the and this is really, it's amazing. BP, the BPL doesn't shy away from difficult topics either with their programming. They have discussions on being LGBTQI, on puberty, on sex education for teens. They have workshops on healthy relationships. It's, it's really spectacular to see. I've witnessed their programming evolve over the lockdown period. And it was interesting to see that during the time when most library services were still trying to find their feet, BPL was off and running in regard to programming anyway. I'm not sure what was happening behind the scenes. I believe this book club had a higher purpose than just literary discussion. Although that was pretty engaging too. And I had lot, we had lots of discussions about what a CAD Heathcliff was and we mulled over a question for the ages on why does Heathcliff have only one name, much like Madonna or Cher. I still haven't been able to find an answer. <laughs> the program provided both a distraction as well as a means for well-being and emotional support for everyone involved. The concern and warmth shared between David and his regular patrons was highly evident and very touching. Each week there was discussion about how everyone was going, how mutual friends and acquaintances were holding up. Whilst writing this presentation, I went back through my original notes for the research I was doing and I had written this. For this library, I feel that the book club is very much about checking in with their patrons and providing a distraction as well as an outlet for mental, uh, for well-being and mental health, which I think is a much overlooked but really important part of what we do as librarians. In any job, it can, it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day day -day tasks of your role. As librarians, I think we can have a real impact on the quality of people's lives. The American Library Association talks about libraries giving their communities something intangible, but which is essential for a satisfying life. They call it nourishment for the spirit. I really love that. The ALA goes on to describe how library programming can illuminate the experiences and beliefs and values that unite us as human beings. That these programs can stimulate us to make connections where we noticed none before between our ancestors and ourselves, between one culture and another, between the community and the individual. Now, I know that that's a big ask for your average children's story time or learn to use Microsoft Word digital literacy session. But if we really examine the impact we can have, I think we'll see how important our role can be in our community. It is difficult to quantify the intrinsic value of libraries information professionals and academics have been trying to agree on a methodology for years. I know, however, that if asked, these book club attendees would say that the impact from this one program was truly life affirming. I know this because that's how it affected me. And I was over 15,000 kilometres away. So now there is someone who's over 15,000 kilometres away who's joining us. And I would like to introduce David Kamara. From, well, you're coming from Queens, aren't you? Not Brooklyn. And it's very early in the morning. So please, <laughs> please cut him some slack. It's about 2 or 3.30 in the morning, something like that. David, I'd love you to talk about your perspective on this story and, and maybe highlight some of the amazing work that you guys do over in the BPL. Wow, Kaylee, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation, but the kind words. Um, um, I, I, I don't know what to say. That means a lot to me. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I haven't been in a branch physically since the middle of March. 
and I won't be in, in, in one until almost the middle of September next month. Um, but in a lot of ways, um, this has been a wonderful experience. Uh, challenging, um, frightening at times. Um, I tell my 11 year old son that we're living history. Um, and I, it, we look out the window, as you said, and we see it. Um, online programming for the Brooklyn Public Library um, has, has, has worked well. Um, and it's, it's a, and it's, what can I say? Um, I'll give a super quick lesson, a, a history lesson of, of the library's systems in New York, New York City. There are three. The most famous is the New York Public Library, which covers the boroughs of Manhattan, um, Staten Island, and the Bronx. New York, of course, is made up of five boroughs. The Queens Library system uh, is another separate one. Um, and mine is the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, we have, in Brooklyn, we have uh, uh, 60 branches and um, soon to be 61. And we are the smallest of the three, even though we're the fifth biggest in the country. Uh, Queens has almost 70. New York Public is probably the biggest system in the world. They have 100, almost 100. Um, our, I, we've, the three have different kind of personalities and strengths. New York Public Library is, is, is world famous for its research divisions, which the contents of which are almost priceless. Um, Queen's, Queen's system has the largest, the best, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the biggest circulation of anywhere in the country. For some reason, it's number one. Um, so we've kind of carved out a niche for ourselves in terms of public service. We like to think of ourselves as, as the public service system. Maybe we're giving ourselves a little bit too much credit. The other systems, I'm sure, are wonderful with public service as well. Um, but we've kind of made that our thing. Um, so when, uh, and, and, and thank you, Kelly. So we've, we've for, for, I've been, I've been with the system almost 18 years. Um, it precedes me, of course. Um, we've taken pride in our in-person uh, small group, medium, large group, all the different ages, as Kaylee said, juvenile, young adult, uh, adults and, and seniors um, to our in-person programming. Um, so when we were faced with this challenge of going strictly online, um, it was it, it was something that I, I think we felt we felt confident we could do. Um, and it's worked well. I wish I had, I wish I had numbers. Um, I'm not a number cruncher kind of person. Um, I, I, I just submit data. I don't really analyze data too much. Um, uh, but judging from the feedback from patrons and from what we call the third floor, which is our executive leadership on the third floor of our headquarters library, um, uh, there, we, we've gotten wonderful feedback from both. <laughs> um, uh, so it's worked, it's worked well. Um, for example, the computer I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you right now, coming to you with, uh, is, was brought to me, um, is, is, is BPL property and was brought to me and set up for me in my, in my apartment. Um, and it's helped me at first first couple of months I was using my iPhone for, for our book discussions, Kaylee, but uh, <laughs> really? like that. Um, yeah. Um, um, the other, the other reason I think that it's, it's, it's worked well is because there, as Kaylee sort of suggested, we have very few limits. Um, all of us um, on staff are, are encouraged to be as creative um, as we want to be. Um, 
we don't check in with anybody. We think of a program, we design the program, we offer the program on, on uh, and now uh, uh, um, during this crisis on uh, online platforms. Um, and we go with it. We don't ask anyone's permission. Um, I think we're, <laughs> uh, and we just, we just, we do it. Um, some of us, I, 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 you know, like to stretch boundaries. Um, we're, I think we're trusted not to really break them and, and um, uh, insult the public's mores and so on. And I hope, I don't think that's, that happens very often. Um, but it's, it's, it's been, it's been wonderful to serve um, in this way. That's amazing. Do you guys meet up, like um, a lot of us have mentioned about um, meeting on Skype and Zoom and Teams and things, is that, do you guys keep in contact with all of your? Um, later this afternoon, um, 3 p.m. New York time, I have a, I have with, uh, what we call a system-wide meeting, which is, Everybody in in in, uh, in Brooklyn Public Library will be will be joining in via Zoom. Um, uh, there'll be a lot of presentations. It'll be very much similar to the format that you've had here. Right. Uh, so That's we, exciting. So these things are regular. Uh, twice a week, at least, um, we have Zoom meetings. Uh, we're encouraged to do webinars and, and uh, we have our own training system online called Train Station, very clever, um, that we will do to, to improve, for, for self-improvement in terms of learning new computer programming and things. Great. Are we getting the wind up, Tony? Is this? I was trying to be really subtle. No, that's okay. Can I just quickly share my screen with my um, PowerPoint and just yep. wind it up? Thank you, David. That was amazing. That was great. I'm just going to share my screen with um, my PowerPoint there. Okay. Is that being seen? Okay. That was great. I've really loved um, sharing sharing pr the professional exchanges between um, a whole different library system has really been amazing for me. Um, and I've been sharing it with my team at work and they've really loved hearing all the stories. Uh, library programming is something that I'm passionate about and I think the lessons I've learned from BPL is that if you set out a clear aim to provide high quality programming, that matches your patrons' needs and wants and combine this with motivated and empowered staff, you can end up doing really amazing things. At Ipswich Libraries, we have a dedicated programming team, which um, I'm really proud to be a part of. Um, we have a lot of experience delivering face-to-face -face programming, but not so much in the virtual world. So that was the aim at the start of this, was to find out how we could use technology to, um, to continue offering amazing uh, programs. Um, we haven't been as fast as Brooklyn in our response. It's been quite thoughtful and measured. But now, as you can see, we're offering a real range of, of programs to a wide variety of demographics. Um, I won't list them all there, but you can see them. Um, we've also really tried to be thoughtful using things like our Be Connected program for our seniors to try and um, empower them with learning how to use Zoom so that then they can go online and, and use more of our programs and, and give them really practical skills. And we did start our own book club, um, in case you're wondering, after all of that. <laughs> it's called Fiction Addiction, not your average book club. It's based on themed book chats and we've only just started it but the discussions have been lively and full. Um, to wrap up, I'd just like to say, and this is pretty cheesy, but let's go with it because of the survivor. The aim of this game is not to be the sole survivor, but for all of us, no matter what tribe we're from, is to survive and thrive. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, David. Really appreciate the effort of, of participating in our little event here um, at that hour of the day. Um, you shall uh, regain the status of legendary uh, web <laughs> webinar participant. <laughs> yes, thanks, David. I appreciate it. <laughs>
Okay, um, so we are at the pointy end of our evening. Um, that was our presentation on uh, Brisbane to Brooklyn via Wuthering Heights. Um, I, the other thing that I do have to say is that our presenters will be receiving gifts courtesy of the Australian Library Information Association. Um, I have it on reliable authority that there is some great ALIA merchandise, some of which may actually be future collectible merchandise from the conference that never happened in 2020. Um, so hang on to that. One day it's going to be worth money, uh, <coughs> courtesy of our uh, ALIA Queensland coordinator, the, um, the, um, the lovely James, who I believe is actually watching this. So uh, James, thank you very much. And I will proceed from there to question time. So um, Annie or Catherine, have we got any standout questions from the group that we can um, pass on to our participants? Um, Tony, there aren't any questions as yet. <laughs> OK. Might give it a moment. <laughs> People who have questions, type furiously, and we shall make the answers appear. While people are typing their questions, I will point out that uh, I did see a couple of, of chat comments there um, commending our various participants um, for what they brought to this evening's meeting. And I just wanted to, to back that up. Um, you've all been spectacular in a number of ways. Um, well worth listening to. Um, Tony, we have a question from James um, with regards to program programming at Ipswich. Uh, will you have a dedicated online team now or just integrate it into your normal jobs? So, Kaylee or? Yes. Um, well, we haven't got one as such. I can't speak on what the powers that be might do in the future, but um, basically all that we are broken up into teams. We have a children's team. We have a technology team and we have an adult team. We all do um, slightly other things included within those umbrellas. Um, but so far, each team has just taken it upon themselves to write programs uh, that are based within their sections and put them online. I'm in the technology team and one of the ones we've been doing is uh, Lego engineering. That's for the school children, school age children and and they build things and they do it in real time on Zoom with their own Lego at home. It's been really popular. We've had coding. We've, um, we've, had, we've got the future of work for teenagers at the moment and that's um, hosted by Bob Industries and that's making, helping teenagers sort of look at their futures and see where things are going. Um, the adult team are doing lots of really interesting things with chasing our past and author hours and creative things as well. Children's stuff, we've got story times and yoga story times and um, all sorts of holiday programs. So yeah, we've just, we've just stepped up our role and moved it, sort of pivoted it into technology based. So I hope that's good. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, I actually have a question. I'd like to um, to speak to, to Peter Vegan, if I may. Um, Peter, just listening to the stuff that's coming out of the, uh, the, the Brooklyn Library um, and the ways that libraries have been um, kind of moving into this online delivery with varying degrees of, of planning and coordination, I did note in your conversation that you were very much a, uh, a coordinator of teams, and I wondered if you had any advice that you could offer us, uh, those of us who are trying to get some of this off the ground and happening? Wow, that's, that's, that's a really important and really big question, I think, is, um, is, is getting people um, familiar and uh, confident to use Teams. So, um, I, I, look, I watched with with fascination, uh, Ray Lee, Karen, Kaylee, David, really, really interesting. Um, uh, and, and what I thought was, um, you know, that my greatest fear was um, speaking in public. Um, in school, I'd be terrified if I had to do two minutes up the front of the class. And, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's a, I, I think you have to deal with the human element and the human behavior. 
and and uh, ease people into a team's environment where they are confident speaking, where they are confident engaging, but but they don't necessarily need to be perfect. And we, you know, we, I see a whole range of people I've seen, you know, really engaging and uh, fabulous and fascinating people who can articulate, but that's not what the world is. The world is all different sorts of people. And I think we need to encourage people to, uh, to engage. And team is, Teams is a wonderful way of doing that. We started off just with voice and now we all put our, put our uh, video on and, uh, you know, and uh, you've got that tactile, you've got that personal touch. So I, I, I think there's a developmental aspect to it. There's a, a human behavioral aspect to it. And um, uh, just, just as, a, as, as a sidebar, eight years ago, uh, I started doing a presentation for the air traffic controllers in the Air Force and I, I needed a title. And this is ironic because I, I, I titled it Human Behavior in a disrupted environment. And here we are today. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, um, Andy, Catherine, have you got any other questions out of the chat? Um, there's just a comment from Beck here about um, posting this on Twitter as well with the hashtag Alia Queensland Survivor hashtag to broaden the discussion. Um, she thinks that Kaylee and David's presentation makes room for a lot of discussion about programming to the normal branch audience versus the new global audience. Um, so that's more of a comment. And just have a look to see if there's any other questions. Um, looks like there's one from Rosalie to David. Um, if you had to pick one program, which one has been the most appreciated by your community during this period? Children's story times with a, with um, children's yoga a very close second. It would be it would be the juvenile um, programs. Um, yeah, um, during normal times, uh, another uh, wonderful one um, uh, is it would be a free free breakfasts for, for for children in 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 all the branches. Um, so those, those are, those are, those are three geared mostly for children. Cool. Okay. Um, look, we'll, we'll, uh, if anyone has any other questions that they'd like to answer, now is your great opportunity. Um, I'm glad that the, uh, the hashtag Ali Kings and Survivors mentioned, please, um, feel free to, uh, to use that in any social media. Um, those things that you're doing, because we do love the profile. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody for coming along here, taking time out of your own evenings um, to share these stories um, and share with your teams um, as you go away into the, the next weeks that there's going to be another one of these. We have done Outwit, we have yet to do Outplay and Outlast, and the, uh, the fourth and the last uh, session is going to have a number of, um, of people with some profile um, in a discussion panel. Um, so we'll be very interested in trying to generate questions out of these seminars and we'll feed them to that panel. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much for taking time to participate. Um, thank you to the uh, the Alia Queensland group um, and to James, our Alia coordinator for Queensland. Coordinator? Manager. I, I'm the manager for Queensland. Um, so uh, we will be sending out some merchandise to our presenters um, and James has, I believe, uh, about to receive a, a gift card um, from IOP, which is, uh, we're grateful for their sponsorship in today's event. Please take some time to check them out. Um, and thank you, everybody.